Today, we're cooking up collard greens and chatting about serving Southern comfort food as social activism with chef Michael Twitty on Cooking with Pride. The kitchen has always been a place for people to come together and share their stories. I've invited a few of my favorite food friends from the LGBTQIA community to share their stories about cooking, connecting in the kitchen, and creating recipes that inspire others. This is Cooking with Pride. All right, so I'm gonna cut these guys up. Very thinly. Okay, very thin. Yep, keep it rolling, beautiful. Michael, what are we making today? Why so, am I cutting up these onions? Because we're making a collard green recipe that has a very sort of fusion stock. I'm interested in the fusion between global diaspora cultures. Mm. Now, while people think of collard greens being especially Southern, and they are, they're a deep part of the African-American culinary experience in the South and our influence, but the way we're making them today has a little smoked tea. So you just smoked tea oh. collard greens. So they're vegetarian, they're vegan. When you have a limited amount of repertoire of what you're doing with your food, it forces you to be more creative. Yeah. African-American cooking, African cooking, African diaspora cooking, uh, for Caribbean cooking, is based on flavor, mm -hmm. color, purpose. The purpose is that we're family because we're in the kitchen cooking together. Yeah family that comes from similar backgrounds in terms of food. And the job of the food is to bring us together. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose. Not, did you sous vide it? Is it chiffonaded properly? Yeah. That's not our culture. The Southern kitchen is based on fresh vegetables, fresh proteins. It's based on fresh herbs and lots of spices. And it's based on the seasons. It's just as elemental and just as natural as anybody else's cuisine palette. And what we're doing today is we're also showing that Southern cuisine has always been international. Mm -hmm. It's always drawn from all those influences that came into those port towns, all those influences that came with people who came to the South from various parts of the world and still today. We're gonna start building the stock now. Yes. I'm gonna sweat the onions. So let's put in the green onions. Okay. Fantastic. Throw in our garlic, and we're gonna stir it around for a little bit. I went to West Africa, and what you find that's very interesting is that all of those countries, onion, green onion, garlic, ginger, hot pepper, mm -hmm. tomato, bell pepper, are the building blocks of almost all the sauces and flavorings. Because these are all tropical-based, cuisines and climates that support a wide variety of agricultural products that have a lot of beautiful wild resources, we kind of know how to work with those. Yeah. So for me, for somebody to say, well, that's not what I'm used to, that's not us, I'm telling you, that's us. It's a commonality. And for me, part of the cooking process, especially as a queer Jewish black person with Southern heritage, I'm already complicated, part of it is about bringing people together, saying, okay, you're from this part of the world, you have that going for you. We're from this part of the world, we do this. How can we make it all talk together? Yeah, I Speak love Speak the same language. I feel like food is such a great way to do that too because whenever people have come over and my mom has made Thai food or I've made food for them, I feel like there's always a conversation right. that starts around it. We're gonna put a little bit of salt in here. What was it like growing up in the South as a black, gay, Jewish man? You have these struggles and these challenges, but what does the generation before you say? Oh, you don't know how hard it was. Mm -hmm. You don't know. You don't know what I did so you could be here. I had issues where people assaulted or insulted my ethnicity, my sexual orientation, etc. And so it was this balance between being told, you don't know how good you have it, but also not knowing how to deal with the prejudice of people who are around you. That was one thing, but also the humor and the survival of my parents and grandparents came right through. We laughed our way through a lot of the stuff that happened to us. And we cooked through it, mm -hmm. and that was a big part of it. When we talk about this particular dish, which is you know me throwing all the different parts of my life together, growing up in a multicultural community outside of Washington, D.C., that was a beautiful thing because we have an, you know a bigger Southern larder. So that's why it's so important people understand that Southern is not just salt and pepper Southerners, it's everybody. Yeah. We sweated down the onions and the garlic and the green onions. And now what we have to do is, this is the fun part. We have porcini and shiitake mushrooms. Okay. 
how did you realize that you are Jewish and how did you tell your family? When I was seven years old, I told my mom that I was Jewish. I had very little understanding of how that actually worked. I knew what Jewish was and I knew a lot about Jewish ritual because I, you know, grew up in a community where I helped build the sukkah every year. But my mother was like, you know what? <laughs> My seven-year-old is not going to declare himself <laughs> anything. My mom says to me, okay, you want to be Jewish? Fine. So she let me be Jewish for a week. Your test week. My test week. <laughs> and I was very good at it. I was, I, was, I was a very good, very good Jewish boy. At the end of the week, my mother sat me down at the kitchen table. What did the test week consist of? It was just, it was kind of weird. I, had, I wore a kippah, I wore a yarmulke. I didn't go to church that week. <laughs> uh, I didn't eat bacon. I only read the first part of the Bible, all this other stuff. My mom sat me down. She said, okay, you know what? You've been very good. Let's do the mushroom okay. next. She says, you've been a very good, you know, practitioner of your faith. And um, I'm so pleased. So I sat there at the table, puffed up. And my mother said to me, well, I'm so proud of you. Now we have to take things to the next level. And she goes, Remember what the um, doctor did when you were a little baby in the hospital? And I said, like what? <laughs> she says, you know, you know, the thing they did to your penis. Oh, my God. And I said, oh, oh, what? Because, you know, homeboy don't even like his finger pricked, right? <laughs> and then I would just, she was just like, well, they have to do it all over again, so let's go. Child, <laughs> I was un-Jewish so fast, it oh. wasn't funny. My mother, a blessed memory, she may have won the battle, but she lost the war. Oh, my gosh. That's, that was my first foray into Judaism when I was seven years old. Oh, my God. I love that story. And I think it's also reflective of how, as adults, we tend to underestimate the self-awareness of children. Mm -hmm. We were all just right about so many things when we were kids. Yes. Did you feel that way about being gay, too? I kind of rode the wave of... You're supposed to like girls for a very long time. The problem is, is that I didn't. I didn't really understand what being heterosexual was other than this patriarchal idea. Mm -hmm. And then I just kept on having more of an attraction to males. I didn't, I didn't, I, didn't, I could appreciate that a woman was very pretty. We have these understandings, and they're not always cultural or stereotypical. A lot of them are just really just things that kind of signal to the person, I'm different, yeah. and that's okay. And not everybody falls in a strict spectrum. That took me a long time to learn as well. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, perfect Kenzie Six here. <laughs> so that's all there was to it. Wow. So what was coming out for you like? I came out in the school newspaper. Oh my gosh. Yep. Wait, so what's that story? We had an article in our, an, an opinion piece in our school newspaper about my youth group. And it said, you shouldn't have these ads. It's, it's propaganda. It's making kids gay. No, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. The bottom line was, is that that's what people thought. I wrote in my own opinion piece saying, guess what? I go to this youth group. It didn't make me gay. I was already gay. Yeah. You don't have to worry about that. Worry about I that. took care of that part for you. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And that's and that's how I did that. That was a really proud moment, not in terms of being proud of being LGBT. It meant it was about courage, my yeah. own personal courage. I didn't pat myself on the back. I didn't realize what I did because I'm younger, right? Mm -hmm. I was scared. I was worried. My parents were worried. Well, right, rightly so. But the fact of the matter is I was also lucky. Mm -hmm. I remember a kid called my house. I don't even know who this person is to this day. And they called the house. I picked up the phone, and the person on the side of the phone said, I'm gay too, thank you, and hung mm -hmm. up. There was a lot of people who, you know, I found out much later, they were a gay, lesbian, bi, or transgender as well. But they didn't have the means or the ability to say what I said when I was 16. So what we're going to do is we're going to finish up the stop. Okay. with the rest of our ingredients. All right. And so these are just really just big chunks of parsnip, carrot. I'm just going to cut up a little bit more. We're just kind of increasing the amount of surface space. It gives us some of that flavor. Yep, great. Ooh, that's looking good. Yeah. 
And again, I add a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper at every level. Yeah. But the purpose of the salt isn't just flavor, it's to bring out some of that moisture. So we have that sweetness, we have those flavors. We're gonna give it a good stir, cover it with water, and that's the basis for our very umami-laden, heavy stock. Wow. This is Lapsang Suchong tea. Wait, does this have a scent? I love smelling There you go. So. Ooh. Right? Yeah, that's really smoky. So it is another way, it's like the smoke with pine needles. And so it's another way of getting that flavor in there. And give it one more good stir and let all of that work together. We're gonna get this to a boil, bring it down to a simmer, and just let it do its work. Collard greens before? No, I haven't. So to cut collard greens, we're gonna do this the the grandma way. Why I say grandma way? Because back in the South in the old days, if you gave somebody a stalk, it meant you didn't like them very much, <laughs> or that you were saying about yourself that you couldn't afford to give them anything but the stalk. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna take that, roll them up really, really, really super tight, and then uh -huh. thin strips. See, like that. Activism and food are like one for you. Absolutely. Was that something that happened naturally? Coming from African-American culture, I think people forget that we're not just fun people. Our feel-good music has actually almost always been about social expression, sexual expression, spiritual expression, and protest. Mm -hmm. You know, our academics is about social responsibility meets activism. Mm -hmm. For me, it's a culinary part, but it's also, I'm teaching you about my people, about our history, about our struggles, about our overcoming, and giving you suggestions on ways you can overcome yourself. So a lot of my work is, you know, based on historical Southern cuisine. I wrote a book called The Cooking Gene, which won the James Beard Award. Which but is a big but deal. A big deal. Yeah, BFD. But, al but also, the James Beard was a gay man. Yeah. He was a large gay man, which, you know, I'm proud to be. When I got the award, I addressed both awards in a certain way. And I said, hey, James Beard, thank you for making a big, you know, gay guy a powerful thing. Yeah. Because so many people, you know, they use weight as a means to judge others or spotty size or body type. And the bottom line is this. We all have our, you know, our shells and our struggles and our prides and our privileges. In James Beard... Um, was a gift to the world. But he was still this big, tall, flamboyant gay man who I think will be very proud of those of us in the game today who are surviving mm -hmm. and doing more than surviving, we're thriving. Yeah. All right, you going you to uh, yeah. well, do the thing? Okay, I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to keep up here. I'm a little behind. <laughs> no worries. We don't, we, don't, we don't have a lot to go. But, yeah, for me, it's all together. And, you know, some people, it's all about the food and the food porn. And for me, it's about using the food to change the world. Mm -hmm. Look at the way that food transformed HIV activism. Mm -hmm. The people making food for those who couldn't make food for themselves. Yeah. Or for folks, lesbian folks, who were dealing with breast cancer. They had to go to chemo. They didn't have the resources and the ability to make a dinner for themselves. Mm -hmm. That simple acts like that are, are about food being used to transform the way communities behave. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's a very important thing. So I'm going to get this going. Just a little bit of olive oil. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start with our garlic. Let that start to get nice and smelly. Pinch of that salt, get those juices going. A pinch of that pepper. Who were your culinary inspirations growing up? I watched a lot of PBS. Natalie Dupree was one. She mm -hmm. did New Southern Cooking. Martin Yan, Yan Can Cook, was amazing. Cause he was one of the few people of color. Yeah. You know, I would watch great chefs of New Orleans, great chefs of the West, and that was a big thing for me. I mean, I never thought I could be a, a culinary person full time, but I did tell my mother and father when I was a little boy, they asked me where I want to be, and I told my mother and father, I said, I want to be a chef, a teacher, a writer, and a preacher. Mm. And somehow I feel like you have achieved all those things. Yes, <laughs> I think so. Uh, yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a queer kid thing, too, because, you know, we live these lives of 
multiple possibilities. Totally. Yeah. We are, I think people ask me all the time, well, black, gay, and Jewish, that's a lot. And I said, it's just the same thing with different forms. Mm -hmm. You know, we use satire, the highest form of humor to survive. But we're also poetic and creative. Think about all the things in American culture that are possible because those three groups yeah. did what they had to do, produced, directed, were the talent. Yeah. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud that we made such a contribution to the world. It's so true that often these forms of self-expression are coming out of places of survival and also pain. Right. And I feel like I've realized as I've gotten older is creativity is a luxury. But the more that I've seen just in this country and in other countries, I've seen people use creativity as a form of survival. That's right. And how we survive our oppression is one of our greatest forms of cultural capital. Yeah. Oh, that just gave me goosebumps. Yeah. Yeah. It's everything from the borscht belt to the Chitlin circuit to drag race. Mm -hmm. It's not just what you think it is. Yeah. Same thing with the food. The food is not just a means to an end of hunger. It's also part of our expression of who we are. So we're going to put yours in as well. OK. I just want to use this side of the pan to start the peppers. Get them broken down a little bit. Yep. Yeah. Beautiful. And what I want you to do is I want you to pick up that bowl of stock. And we're going to put a little bit in there. Perfect. Awesome. We're going to go ahead and throw our tomatoes in. OK. Perfect. Wow, this is so colorful. It, you know, reminds you of the flags of African countries, right? Mm -hmm. And we need to add a little bit more stock and let it cook down. These are going to cook down a little bit further. We're going to go, let them go for about a half an hour, break down some more. This is the result of just a little bit of time and a little bit of patience and just letting all those flavors melt together. So now we have a beautiful sauce. I'll plate this up. Fantastic. OK. So you do a lot of cooking and feeding of other people, mm -hmm. but how do you feed yourself and your creativity? I treat the, my home kitchen like a laboratory. Ugh. That's the most important thing, I have fun with it. My meals are, have to do double duty as testing food. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, I just, you know, sometimes I, you know, forget that that's what I'm doing and I totally have fun with it. And other times it's, you go to the grocery store with a mission and your mission is to make something that you can, you know, make for content. Mm -hmm. I'm not traditional. I'm, I'm a very untraditional food writer with a very untraditional mission. But in terms of being sort of like a, a thought influencer who works on activism and culture, I'm very proud that I'm setting a standard. Because there was a time when people said, that ain't going to work. Mm -hmm. Either you give us the food porn or you don't. Yeah. So that's how I roll. Let's move around here. Okay. So now let's look at this. We have these different layers of color and flavor. Give it a, give it a good, you know, smell. Oh. Oh my God, that smells so good. Isn't that something? So here we go. Okay, cheers. cheers. Right, to give it a good toss. Get some of that sauce and that rice together. Oh yeah. Mmm. Mmm. I feel the hint of spice yeah. in there and it really feels like the greens have absorbed all the flavors. Yeah. And it just feels so rich. Oh and my there's God. a meatiness there yeah. without any meat. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. This is so incredible. And this is part of my heritage. I mm -hmm. mean, um, when I was doing my research on the food ways of my African ancestors, in Sierra Leone, the rice is the staple. They say in Sierra Leone, if you haven't eaten rice, you haven't eaten. So this is like my, you know, average, quick, healthy meal. And it speaks to the roots of my mom, which were Mende from Sierra Leone. And her mother and her mother and her mother going back generations, back to a slave ship to South Carolina in the 1700s. So it's something I can give to other people and say, this is, this is a part of you know my story and my history and my family. Yeah, and you know you've done so much 
cooking, I'm sure you have a lot of memorable moments, but what is something that really sticks out to you? Probably, you know, in 2013, I did a dinner um, on the grounds of Stagville Plantation in North Carolina. The meal was cooked completely using local ingredients, using 19th century methods. 150 people, every color, every religion, not religion, orientation, identity, background, in the shadow of four remaining slave cabins on this plantation. The plantation was 10,000 acres with 900 enslaved individuals. Mm. 900. But the thing about it is, is that our ancestors could never have dreamed of that kind of situation, you know, where everybody sat together in sisterhood and brotherhood, breaking bread and honoring them. So I'm proud of that. It was a hard three days. Yeah, how did that feel for <laughs> you personally? I was up for 36 hours straight. <laughs> and then at the end of that, I got my first African ancestry DNA results in the shadow of those cabins. Mm. I reclaimed my identity where it was taken from us. Mm. As a queer man, you know, there's the act of coming out. As a black man, there's the act of reconnecting with your roots. As a Jewish person, there's the obligation to remember both your enslavement, your liberation, your exodus from times of oppression. So for me, that whole, my whole world combined in that one moment. Wow. Yeah. That's really powerful. Well, thank you so much, thank Michael. Thank you very I've, much. It's been I've, awesome. I've loved being here with you today and talking to you and just learning more about you. Yeah, you know, we're a few family now, so yeah. <laughs> we gotta do this again sometime. I know. Oh my gosh. That would be fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.